like to welcome Amanda Gefta. Uh, she studied writing and philosophy at the Eugene Lang College and individualized major about the narrative, uh, literature, journalism, and science at the New York University. Uh, later, she completed a master's degree in history and philosophy of science at the London School of Economics and received a fellowship to study physics and neuroscience at Harvard and MIT. And we are very happy to welcome her. Uh, at the moment, she's a writer and gives lectures all over the world, as I heard the last couple of days. Uh, she wrote articles for the New Scientist magazine, the New York Times, BBC, Quanta magazine, and many more about fundamental physics questions and cosmology. <coughs> and she also has written a book called Trespassing on Einstein's Law about her journey on the search of reality. And uh, this book also gave the award for best physics uh, for best book of the year 2015 by the Physics World magazine. And uh, we are very happy to have her. Uh, we are very happy to have her. And today she will talk about the many observer problem. So let's welcome Anna Gefta. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you first of all so much um, for having me here. I'm, I'm very happy to be here in Vienna and very inspired by the, the passion with which you've organized this whole lecture series. Um, I think it's so important to look at the philosophical foundations of, of physics and I think historically like the greatest minds in physics have done that. So, so I think it's very cool and I'm just very honored to be a part of it. Um, so. I'm sure a lot of you are going to be very familiar with some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, but maybe you haven't thought about them in exactly this context of the problem of multiple observers. Um, so I'm going to go through it sort of within that framework, and hopefully that can inspire some new ideas or new questions, even if it's material that you that you already know. Um, and Basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by just sort of outlining what this problem of multiple observers is um, and looking at how physicists historically have dealt with this. Um, and then we're going to focus mostly on the physicist John Wheeler, um, who really struggled with this, this question throughout his whole career. Um, and I'm going to share with you selections from his personal journals um, where he's tackling this issue. And these journals, like I've spent a lot of time with them and I found them incredibly inspiring and illuminating um, just sort of getting to watch his thought process play out on the page and, and seeing all the ways that he um, his philosophical prejudices and personality sometimes sort of get the best of him in informing or distorting his views of, of physics um, but I found them like so inspiring I hope you guys will too um, and then if you'll allow me to indulge in a little speculation, I can talk very briefly at the end about how I think like some of this links up with issues in cognitive science and philosophy of mind. So, <laughs> okay, so to start, what exactly is the problem of multiple observers? Um, in a sense, it's really simple, but it's something that I think we forget to worry about sometimes. So. I just want to make sure everyone in the room is sufficiently worried. Um, so, okay, so we know that when an observer makes a measurement on a quantum system, the probabilities for the outcome of the measurement are given by the square of the amplitude of the wave function, and the single outcome of any single measurement um, seems to be fundamentally random. But the question that we're asking here is this. If I make a measurement, let's say I measure the spin of an electron along some axis and I find that it's spin up. Is it spin up for everyone or just for me? How do I share the outcome of my measurement with other observers? Why would we all agree? How does the electron with spin up for me become an electron with spin up for everyone? So that's the problem, multiple observers. And this is how Wheeler poses the question in one of his journal entries. He says, does the one who makes a quantum mechanical measurement act as agent for all the others? And the problem is that the formalism of quantum mechanics doesn't seem to give us any obvious way for that to happen. Um, the formalism tells us how to define measurement outcomes relative to individual observers, but not relative to multiple observers. And so 
it seems like we're forced to make a choice. Either we have to add something onto the formalism to allow for multiple observers, or we have to come to grips with the idea that quantum mechanics only applies to one observer at a time, that it's uh, what the physicist Chris Fuchs calls a single user theory, and then deal with the philosophical ramifications of that. So that's the question. How can a measurement outcome be shared by multiple observers? And it's really just another way of asking, like, how can there be an objective world? Because an objective world is, by definition, one that is the same for all observers. And so this is really just a question about realism at heart. Um, and, and since this lecture series is about realism, I think this is just one angle from which you can approach that question in a very specific way. Um, but ultimately, this question of multiple observers is really a question about the nature of reality. So Wheeler liked to say that no one saw deeper into the central point of quantum theory than Niels Bohr. So um, I'm going to start with Bohr and just look at how he thought about this problem and what he proposed as solutions. So this is a very typical Bohr quote. He says, the finite magnitude of the quantum of action prevents altogether a sharp distinction being made between a phenomenon and the agency by which it's observed. And this is really the heart of Bohr's interpretation of quantum mechanics, so it's worth just taking a second to unpack. Um, so what Bohr is calling the quantum of action is what we would more likely today call Planck's constant. Um, and what he's saying is that the fact that Planck's constant is non-zero prevents us from being able to separate subject and object, not just practically speaking, but in a profound and fundamental way. So he's saying that in any observation, there's going to be an a finite and irreducible overlap between observer and observed, this sort of minimal area of commingling where they like can't be pulled apart. So in Bohr's view, Planck's constant like very literally measures the size of this irreducible overlap between subject and object. And this is my sophisticated drawing. Um, and you'll see it's inspired by a, a classic Wheeler image. But the idea here is that you have the subject, who's this weird guy, and the object, which is the tree, and they sort of look like separate things, except that when you really look closely, you see there's this irreducible area of overlap, and they're actually stuck together. And so that's what Bohr is, is describing as the quantum of action. Um, and I think, despite the drawing, it's actually a, a profound point that Bohr is making, because we often sort of talk about quantum mechanics, like when we say, like, quantum mechanics makes everything discrete. We sort of talk about it as if there are things in the world that are observer independent and those things come in discrete chunks. But what Bohr is really emphasizing is like the discreteness is the overlap between the subject and the object. The discreteness is not a property of the object alone. Um, and so I think one useful way to think about this is to say, that Bohr thought of the quantum of action as a kind of coupling constant between subject and object. So if you sort of imagine turning down the strength of that coupling constant, the overlap between subject and object, observer and observer, get smaller and smaller. And then if you turned it all the way down to zero, there'd be no overlap at all. Observer and observed could be neatly separated. And that would give you an objective observer independent world. And it would recover classical physics. So if you could do that, um, you would free the object from its subject, and then it would be free to be shared by other subjects. Uh, but when it's non-zero, you're, you're stuck with this coupling, um, and subject and object are, are just fundamentally stuck together. And of course, the finite magnitude of Planck's constant is what gives us non-zero uncertainty relations. Um, so if h was zero here, we'd have no uncertainty. And as long as it's finite, you have this irreducible uncertainty. But, but the point is that, in Bohr's view, the uncertainty arises precisely because of this blurring between observer and observed. Um, and I think Heisenberg seemed to see the meaning of his uncertainty relations and of quantum mechanics more generally in much the same way. Um, in speaking of the meaning of the wave function, Heisenberg said, the probability function represents a mixture of two things, partly a fact and partly our knowledge of a fact. So it's a mixing of subject and object. It's not one or the other. It's about the relationship. And so often in philosophy of physics, we ask questions like, is the wave function ontological? Is it describing the world? Or is it epistemological? Is it describing the, observer, the observer's knowledge? 
And what the early um, founders of quantum mechanics, like Bohr and Heisenberg, seemed to think was that it's really not one or the other, it's a mix of the two. And it's precisely the fact that they're mixed and the fact that there's a finite, uh, irreducible size of that mixture quantified as Planck's constant that is the essence of quantum physics. This is a quote that I really like um, from Zurich, who's a physicist at Los Alamos, and he was a student of Wheeler's. Um, he says here, in quantum mechanics, what is known about a system's state is inextricably intertwined with what it is. Classical states, in contrast, have existence independently of knowledge of them. To put it tersely and in the spirit of complementarity, quantum states play both ontic and epistemic roles. And Zurich actually coins a term for this. He calls it epiontic. And I think this is sort of a useful term to have at your disposal because it helps avoid slipping into talk that's either purely objective or purely subjective because either one requires this sort of neat separation between subject and object that the finite magnitude of the quantum of action is, is expressly forbidding. And so all of this, I think, raises this very general fundamental question, which is the question of, of the lecture series, I think, um, what is quantum mechanics a theory of? Because in classical physics, we said physics, it's a theory of the world. It's how the world works, independent of any subject. And what we're seeing here is that if you really can't separate subject and object, if they're really stuck together, then it doesn't seem like we can say that quantum mechanics is a theory just of the object. But likewise, I don't think we can say it's a theory just of the subject. Um, and so it seems like we're forced to say, as, as Bohr would agree, that it's a theory of the relationship between the two. So it's a theory of the relation between the subject and object. Um, that because they can't be pulled apart, it becomes like the sort of fundamental smallest unit of reality. You can't get past it. Okay. So Bohr likes to draw a parallel between like this understanding of quantum mechanics and, and that of relativity. He wrote, this new feature of natural philosophy, meaning like this intermingling of subject and object, means a radical revision of our attitude as regards physical reality, which may be paralleled with the general theory of relativity. And he was writing this pretty much directly to Einstein, and it was sort of his way of saying like, okay, Einstein, like you don't like the, the deep relativity of quantum mechanics, but like you started it. This is just a bigger generalization of what you were doing. And so I think in that quote, you can see that Bohr was really thinking of quantum mechanics as a theory of relations, um, that it was about contextuality and the relativity of reality. Um, and I think it's like a useful comparison to keep in mind because when you think about, like for instance, Einstein making motion relative, the idea is like you can say, if you have two objects that are in motion relative to each other, you can't say, one's really in motion and one is really at rest. Like there's just no meaning to the word really because motion is not a feature of a single object. Motion is a relational concept from the start. It only applies to a relation between two things. And so quantum mechanics is sort of doing the same thing but it's making the world even more relative. Um, and it's saying that everything has to be defined in terms of the subject-object relation. So, so for Bohr, like if you were to make this measurement on the electron and you find that it's spin up, I think he would say it's not like your, it's not like the electron already was spin up and it just had that property independently and you just sort of came along and happened to see it. But likewise, it's not that your measuring it imposes the spin upness on the electron, like you're not causing it to have spin up. It's just that the spin of the electron was never a property of the electron or of your knowledge, it's, a, it's by definition a property of the relationship in the same way that motion would be by definition a relational property. Um, so, so I think when we bear in mind that kind of fundamental contextuality um, and that relational aspect of quantum mechanics, we can like prevent ourselves from falling into these conceptual traps where you end up saying things like, oh, the observer, like changes the world just by looking at it or the particle knows it's being watched and so it does something different or sort of any of the common like misunderstandings of quantum mechanics like they all sort of seem to come from this mistaken assumption that subject and object can be 
treated separately when, in fact, they can't. But it's the fact that they can't that specifically gives rise to this problem of multiple observers. Because if it's logically meaningless and physically impossible to, to separate subject and object neatly, and if quantum mechanics is a theory of their relation, then you just can't talk about one object being shared by multiple subjects. Like, they come in pairs, and they can't be separated. So if the electron spin that I observe is not a property of the electron, and it's not a property of me, but it's a property of their relation, like, there's just no way to export that relation to some other observer, because that other observer would have their own relation. So you're sort of always stuck in one pair. And Zerk sums it up really nicely. He says, in classical physics, you can find out the state of a system, and then someone else can come along and find out the state of the same system, and you'll both agree. In quantum mechanics, that's generally impossible. So Bohr was fully aware of this multiple observer problem, and he had two solutions that he proposed. First, he said, the outcome of the quantum measurement undergoes an irreversible act of amplification. That was his phrase. And the idea, I guess, was that even though the, the measurement outcome is sort of born conjoined with its observer, it's then amplified in this irreversible way that it can then be shared by everyone. And I can't really explain it any better than that because Bohr never explained it any better than that. Um, he really never gave a mechanism. It was just a phrase he used a lot. And I think maybe if we're being generous, we can sort of think that he meant something along the lines of like, an early version of decoherence. Um, but he, he really just used this phrase and, and didn't justify it. And the second solution that he posed was an observed phenomenon can be shared by expressing it in plain, unambiguous language. That was his other phrase. And again, he never really explained how this works, but I guess simplistically the idea is like, if I measure the spin of the electron and find that it's spin up, that might preclude you from coming along and making the same measurement, but it doesn't matter because I'll just tell you what I found. So we can just tell each other what we see and then through language create this sort of shared reality. And that's all great, except that neither of those makes any sense when you really think about it. Um, the problem with the first one is that quantum mechanics is not irreversible. Um, it's time reverse invariant. It's unitary. And so if you're going to break unitarity, you need to have some mechanism by which you're doing that. Um, and then at that point, you're already going beyond the, the formalism. So, so it doesn't seem like anything truly irreversible can take place. And if we said, OK, maybe he was thinking something like decoherence, well, in decoherence, we don't have to say something truly irreversible is happening, because it's not. But it's more like, for all practical purposes, it's irreversible and, and gives you something that looks like a classical world. But the problem is that the most that can buy you is like the illusion of a world shared by multiple observers, not an actual world shared by multiple observers. Um, and this is another quote from Zurich, which I use just because he's one of the founders of, of decoherence theory. So if anyone would think that decoherence could solve this problem, it would have been Zurich, but he doesn't. Um, he says, my view of reality has to do with what philosophers call inner subjectivity. Reality is what we agree on. In that sense, it's what's invariant. But the invariance, and hence quantum reality, is not fundamental. It's emergent and approximate. And so Zurich says, sure, you can use decoherence to make the world look classical. Um, and you can sort of get an illusion of inner subjectivity. But, but at the bottom, it's an illusion. At the bottom, all you have are these subject-object pairs that are stuck together. OK, so what about communicating in plain, unambiguous language? First, there's the question of what is plain, unambiguous language. Um, but even if you can define that, the bigger issue is like, if I communicate my findings with you, if I tell you my electron was spin up, I'm either like moving my vocal cords and moving the air so you can hear what I'm saying, or I'm writing it on a piece of paper and handing it to you. But whatever I'm doing, is, it's a physical process. Um, I can't communicate in some way outside the laws of physics. So the very process of communication is governed by quantum mechanics, and so it doesn't seem like you can use it to get around quantum mechanics. So, so Bohr's solutions to this problem never quite added up, um, but he was like the guru of quantum mechanics, and so everyone was kind of like, OK, Bohr said it was solved. It must be solved. Um, 
And no one really explicitly challenged it until Eugene Wigner. And Wigner, Wigner was a Hungarian physicist. He was at Princeton at the same time as Wheeler. Um, and it was there in the 1950s that he began to formulate this thought experiment that's become known as Wigner's friend. And it goes something like this. So this, of course, is Schrodinger's cat. Um, he's in a box with a radioactive particle that may or may not decay. Uh, if it does, it will trigger the release of a poison that will kill the cat. And until an observer comes along, quantum mechanics tells us the particle is in a superposition of having decayed and not having decayed, and therefore the cat is in a superposition of being dead and alive. So an observer comes along, we'll call him Wigner, and he opens the box and happily finds the cat's alive. So at this point, everything's good. Like the cat's in a definite state, Wigner never saw the superposition, and if you could sort of just stop here, everything would be fine and quantum mechanics would be consistent. But what Wigner said is like, you can't stop here because Wigner and the cat together are in a room. So like they're in their own box and relative to some second observer who we can call Wigner's friend, this joint system of cat plus Wigner are now in a superposition of Wigner having observed an alive cat and Wigner having observed a dead cat. So now you have a contradiction because if you ask Wigner, is the cat alive or dead, he's gonna say it's alive. And if you ask Wigner's friend, what's the state of the cat? The quantum formalism tells us that the correct answer to that is the cat is in a superposition of dead and alive. So, so you have two different stories. These are contradictory accounts of the same object. And of course, from some other point of view, Wigner's friend is in a box and another guy can come along and he's in a box and so you get this infinite regress and, and because the universe by definition has, has no outside, there can't be like one last observer who has the final say and whatever he says is the truth and everyone else is wrong. Um, and this turns out to be like sort of a, a, a deep point in quantum cosmology that you have this system that contains all of its observers on the inside and so because of that, any subject can, from some other point of view, become the object, and so you're always gonna have this sort of nested set of contradictory accounts. So Wigner said, you know, this theory of quantum measurement is logically consistent as long as I maintain my privileged position as ultimate observer, like if we had just stopped with that first observer, everything would be fine, um, but he was not a solipsist, he didn't wanna say I'm the only observer in the universe, and so the only other explanation he could come up with was maybe there's something different about consciousness that prevents it from being in a superposition. And so if we, for the sake of argument, assume the cat is, does not have consciousness, then you could say the cat can be in a superposition, but Wigner himself can't. So, so if his friend comes along and says, oh, the cat's still in a superposition because he's now correlated with Wigner's superposition, well, he's just applying quantum mechanics in a way that it's not meant to be applied because it can't be applied to conscious observers. Um, and so in that case, the su like any subject can't be treated as an object, and so no two conscious observers are gonna end up with contradictory accounts of the same system. Um, so the being with consciousness must have a different role in quantum mechanics Therefore, the joint system of friend plus object cannot be described by a wave function. So this, of course, is not what the quantum formalism gives you. This is like an ad hoc thing that you have to tack on to say quantum mechanics applies to some physical systems but not physical systems of consciousness, and then you need some adequate theory of consciousness to tell you which systems have it. Um, and then basically you have to be willing to believe that consciousness is something over and above physics, that it's some kind of like magical, non-physical stuff. Um, so that's asking a lot. Um, so Wigner at the time was teaching a course at Princeton and one of his students was Hugh Everett. And Everett was just about to start working on his thesis under Wheeler, which would become this famous Many Worlds thesis. But he was taking just a single course at the time and that was Wigner's. And, and this was a couple of years before Wigner published his The Wigner's Friend Thought Experiment, but it was clearly something he was thinking about and talking about because it made a big impression on Everett. Um, this is a quote from the philosopher of science, Jeffrey Barrett, who's like an expert on Everett. 
He says, Everett held that one only has a satisfactory solution to the quantum measurement problem if one can provide a consistent account of nested measurement. Concretely, this meant one must be able to tell the Wigner's friend story consistently. So Everett agreed with Wigner that this problem of multiple observers was a real problem. But so in his thesis, he says, the interpretation of quantum mechanics is untenable if we're to consider a universe containing more than one observer. So that's like how he starts. He says, a possible escape route is to postulate the existence of only one observer in the universe. This is the solipsis position in which each of us must hold that he alone is the only valid observer. And this view is quite consistent, but one must feel uneasy when writing textbooks on quantum mechanics for the consumption of persons to whom it does not apply. Um, so he's like, I can solve this whole problem by just saying I'm the only observer in the universe, but then I'm in this really awkward position of like, who am I writing this thesis for? Um, so, so he saw this as the central problem. He wasn't willing to accept Wigner's solution, though, of making consciousness some special thing because Incidentally, Everett was also, had been working uh, with John von Neumann, who was also at Princeton. And von Neumann, in addition to like 10 million other things he was doing, was developing modern computer architecture. Um, and, and Everett had, had seen a lot of this. And von Neumann was making computers based on how he thought the, the brain worked at the time. And the press and a lot of the people at Princeton who were around this project called the computer an electronic brain. And so Everett was sort of in a state of mind where he saw this deep analogy between computing machines and brains. And so he just couldn't, he couldn't be a dualist. He couldn't accept the idea that the conscious brain is something other than just like a complicated physical system. He said, we must insist that, we're, that we be able to conceive of mechanical devices obeying natural laws, which we would be willing to call observers. And I think it's important to note that Bohr actually agreed with this. Everett and Bohr ended up disagreeing on most things, but not on this. Um, Bohr said that he was fully willing to admit that sophisticated enough um, computing machines might someday be indistinguishable from human brains that he did not think consciousness was some magic thing. He was not a dualist. And he actually loved to tell this story. Um, he, he apparently told this story all the time about a blind man with his stick, using his stick to feel his way around the world. And he would say, if the man holds the stick loosely in his hand, he feels the stick as an object. But if he holds it firmly, it becomes like an extension of his arm, and he uses it to feel other objects. So. Bohr thought the story was like very deep, and the, the meaning of it was basically, in one scenario, the stick is on the subject side of the subject-object divide, and on, in the other scenario, it's on the object side of the subject-object divide, but it's the same stick. So, so subject and object must ultimately be like interchangeable labels. Um, they must be arbitrary labels, and therefore, you can't have dualism, because if they're interchangeable, then you can't sort of break that symmetry by saying one, ha the laws of physics apply to one and not the other. Um, so Bohr agreed with Everett on that, but he thought this multiple observer problem was already solved um, by his irreversible acts of amplification and communication. Um, and Everett had, so now had ruled out Wigner's solution of, of consciousness, but he also ruled out Bohr's solution because he rejected the idea that communication was something other than an ordinary uh, quantum interaction. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is an early handwritten draft of his of Everett's dissertation, um, and you can see he's drawn this little doodle of a Wigner's friend scenario. Um, and it's probably hard to see, but what you're looking at is in the in the box. Um, he has an observer who's labeled observer one oh one. Um, and the observer is making a measurement on the system S, and then he's going to write the results of the measurement on the blackboard, which is labeled B. Um, and then outside the room, lurking, we have observer 2. And so Everett's going to show that there's not going to be any agreement between these two observers. And what he's doing is he's taking the Wigner's friend experiment, but he's adding in the blackboard as a way of showing that Bohr's solution of, of communication is not going to help. It's not going to make a difference. Like, it doesn't matter if he writes the solution on the blackboard. 
you're still, like that blackboard's part of the system, it's gonna be in the supervision and you're still gonna have contradictory accounts. Um, so for Everett, language, communication, these are not disembodied activities. He says, we shall wish to allow communication among the observers, we shall regard these processes as observations made by one observer on another. So he's gonna offer a different solution. He says the present thesis forms a logically self-consistent description of a universe in which several observers are at work. So I'm just trying to emphasize like this, the many worlds um, interpretation that he's famous for he came up with this very specifically to answer this question of multiple observers. So how does he do it? Well, I'm sure you guys are mostly familiar um, with his work, but uh, so it's now known as the many worlds interpretation. He called it the relative state formulation. And the idea is basically this. So every time an observer makes measurement, the observer's state becomes correlated with the outcome of the measurement. And that's it, because that's all the quantum formalism gives you, and he's just trying not to go beyond the formalism. Um, it gets weird in the fact that he doesn't see a way of selecting out certain outcomes, and therefore he treats like all possible measurement outcomes as, as equally real. They're sort of an ontological uh, equivalent footing. And so if I measure the electron spin, there's a state in which I find it to be spin up and there's a state in which I find it to be spin down and both of those states exist, but they exist on separate branches of this universal wave function and the branches are sort of kept um, apart from one another by, by decoherence and so, so if we, so we have all the measurement outcomes happening at once and if we sort of focus on the fact that all the outcomes are, are there in this picture, we would call it the many worlds interpretation. If we focus on the fact that the observer is, is splitting into multiple states of having observed different things at every measurement outcome, we might call it the many minds interpretation, which some people do. But if we focus on the fact that actually both of those things are happening, it's this pair of observer and observed on each branch, um, and it's, it's these relations, then we would call it the relative state formulation as Everett did. Um, so it's this relativity of measurement outcomes that solves the Wigner's friend paradox because the two contradictory accounts given by Wigner and his friend just live on different branches now. So it doesn't matter that they're contradictory. We don't have to say one's right, the other's wrong. They can both be correct, but like nobody's going to see that contradiction because they're kept on these separate branches um, and sort of kept apart by the good grace of decoherence. Um, and there's another way of phrasing all of this. When we have contradictions among two subjects regarding the same object, like Wigner says the cat's alive, Wigner's friend says the, the same cat is alive and dead, we can ask, like, in whose reference frame does this contradiction exist? Like, what actual physical observer can compare the two subjects and the one cat and see who's right and who's wrong? And we might be inclined to say, like, this guy can, but that's not actually what's happening because this guy on the outside has now become the subject and Wigner and Wigner's friend and the cat are now all the object. So he's not comparing the subjects, he's just a new subject. Um, so whenever it says that, like, different measurement outcomes correlated with different observer states live on different branches of this universal wave function, that's just a way of saying that you're always in first-person point of view. There's always only one subject, and there's no third-person viewpoint from which you can compare the perspectives of two subjects simultaneously. So what he's really saying is like quantum mechanics is only consistent in first-person point of view. You can only have one subject per object. So when Everett published uh, the short version of his thesis in an issue of uh, Reviews of Modern Physics in 1957, Wheeler published a companion piece um, that went along with it called Assessment of Everett's Relative State Formulation. And Wheeler concludes, in brief, the problem of multiple observers solves itself within the theory of relative states. So that's sort of like Wheeler's public face, but he's in a really tough position because Everett's his student, 
he um, was his mentor on this dissertation and he wants to support him, but Bohr is Wheeler's mentor. And Wheeler idolizes Bohr and he doesn't want to offend him. And Bohr immediately rejects Everett's model. And so Wheeler sort of trying to like negotiate between them. He writes a letter to Bohr coming to Everett's defense and says, I'm concerned with your reaction to this more fundamental question, whether there's any escape from a formalism like Everett's when one wants to deal with a situation where several observers are at work. So you can sort of see there that Wheeler like didn't really think that Bohr had solved the problem. He seems to think there's clearly still an issue. Um, but Bohr insisted, no, there's no problem. And so, so Bohr and Everett find themselves in sort of a stalemate, and, and Wheeler's kind of stuck in the middle. But then Wheeler finds himself wondering, like, did Everett really solve this problem? Because when you start to think about the solution, it's a very weird solution, if you can even call it a solution. Because like on any given branch of the wave function, you're still just talking about a single subject-object pair. Like the subject-object pairs, they remain conjoined, they haven't been pulled apart, and for each subject there's one object, for each object there's one subject. So you still never have two subjects on the same branch, you just have these like solipsistic separate worlds. Like in Everett's branch where he's writing his thesis, there's still no one else to read it. Um, so if, if what you really want is one universe shared by multiple observers, like Everett's formalism doesn't give you that. The best it gives you is many universes, each one containing one observer, and there's no observer who can see more than one branch at a time, so for any actual physical observer, you're still stuck in this situation. So now I want to just take you through some of Wheeler's journals. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, John Archibald Wheeler, he was a leading American physicist. He was born in 1911, and he died in April of 2008, which is, he died uh, exactly 10 years ago tomorrow. So I think it's like a nice time to do a little tribute to him. Um, he spent most of his career at Princeton. Um, he did some time at the end at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, he, uh, he did seminal work on like literally almost everything in physics. Um, he worked out the theory of nuclear fission with Bohr. He worked on gravitational physics. He coined terms like black hole and wormhole. His book Gravitation with Charlie Misner and Kip Thorne, who were both his students, um, is still considered like the Bible of general relativity. He worked on electrodynamics with his student Richard Feynman. He inspired uh, his student Jacob Bekenstein's idea that black hole horizons measure entropy. He worked on early efforts of quantum gravity. Like I could go on and on. He had a hand in everything, and he was always like very ahead of his time. He was deeply bold and original in his thinking, and he was not afraid of philosophy, and was just like a truly brilliant physicist. This is a picture of him when he's young, and I sort of love it because. You can see he's holding a camera and taking a picture in the mirror, so it's like a vintage selfie. And here he is in Princeton in 1954, and of course that's Einstein on the left, and um, the Japanese physicist Hideki Yukawa in the middle, and then that's Wheeler on the right. So I was lucky enough to meet Wheeler very briefly at um, a conference in Princeton in 2002. It was held in honor of his 90th birthday. It was called Science and Ultimate Reality. Um, but I really got to know him very well after he died by spending countless hours uh, at the American Philosophical Society Library in Philadelphia where they have all of his journals. And so he had kept these journals for years and years. He always had one with him. Um, and they're just sort of bursting at the seams with writings and photos and drawings and letters and um, everything. So sometimes he used them to just work through equations. Sometimes he used them to find the right words for things. He's like very famous for coining terms. And if you look in his journals, you'll see that he worked very hard at this. Um, here he's like trying out different words for observer. So you see like spectator, beholder, inspector, looker on, onlooker, spy, scout, sentinel, witness. And there's actually, like, in the journal, just pages and pages of, of synonyms for things. Um, sometimes he would just glue in cartoons that made him laugh. Um, but mostly they just contain, like, his, his thoughts. Um, and they're really 
they're quite beautiful. Um, they're incredibly well organized by Wheeler. I think he was slightly compulsive in his organizing. Um, so if he received any kind of interesting letter or note, he would glue it into the journal. If he talked to someone on the phone, he would take notes on what the conversation was. He would note the start and end time of the call down to the minute. Um, if he went out to dinner, he would sketch the seating chart. If he had to give a lecture, he prepared all the slides in the journals, and then afterwards he would reflect on like what worked and what didn't and what questions people asked. Um, if he glued in a photo, he would put like a transparent overlay on it where he would label everyone in the photo. And if he wrote something on a like the back of an envelope or on a napkin or something and glued it into the journal, he would note not only the date, time, and place of the writing, but also the date, time, and place of the gluing. And when he spilled coffee on the journal, he would label the stain coffee. Um, so, so we're going to dive into the journals like in the early 1970s because that's when he really starts to look at this multiple observer problem. Um, but I just want to give you a little backstory just to like set up where his thinking is. So until the 1960s, Wheeler really didn't think observers should play any role in reality at all. Um, throughout the 1950s, he had this vision of, of deriving all of physics and, and everything in the universe um, just out of space-time. Like space-time would be the only ingredient. Um, in, in a nutshell, he had this idea that gravitation acts on energy, but gravitation is itself a kind of energy, so gravity acts on itself. And so he had this vision of like taking like gravitational waves and having them sort of fold in on themselves and form these little spheres that from the outside would look like fundamental particles, but on the inside would just be made of empty space. Um, and he called this mass without mass. And, and his interest in quantum mechanics at the time had nothing to do with observers, but he was interested in like the effect of quantum uncertainty on the metric of the gravitational field. Um, he coined the term quantum foam to describe the sort of roiling topological mess uh, that space-time would dissolve into at the Planck scale. And he thought that this quantum foam would be filled with all these tiny little wormholes, and so he worked out the physics of wormholes. And, and he had this idea that if you could put like an electric field in the space-time, the lines of flux of the field would be threaded through these little wormholes. And so in the places where a line of, of uh, the electric field went into a wormhole, it would look like you had a little particle that had negative electric charge. And in the places where it sort of emerged from the mouth of a wormhole, it would look like a particle with positive electric charge. But there would actually be no particles anywhere in this picture. It would just be um, fields and sort of the twisted, knotted, warping, craziness of, of space-time. So he had this vision of building everything, all of elementary particle physics, out of this. Um, but as he tried to do it, he started to realize that you couldn't avoid singularities in gravitational collapse. Like, up until this point, people had talked about singularities, but more as, like, mathematical errors or artifacts or something. And he, um, along with people like Penrose and Hawking at the time, like, started to realize, okay, no, these are real physical things, and so he saw that like in gravitational collapse, as you go small enough down to these singularities, space-time itself will be destroyed, and so space-time is like, not fundamental enough to be the basement level ingredient of reality. And so he asked himself, like, well, first of all, like, n not only would space-time not survive, but the laws of physics wouldn't survive. He saw like the, even the conservation laws would be violated in the singularity, and so he sort of asked himself, OK, if space-time is destroyed in collapse and all the laws of physics are destroyed in collapse, what's left to be fundamental? And the only thing he could come up with was the quantum principle. So he gives up on the idea of, of building a universe out of space-time. He starts fresh with the quantum principle as his starting point. And he asks, what is the quantum principle? And he, he says it seems to go back to this fundamental coupling between subject and object. So like, that's where we find him in the early 1970s, this is 1973, he writes, three mysteries call out for clarification, the quantum, the universe, and the mind. All three threaten that clean separation between observer and observed, which for so long seemed the essence of science. Um, 
so this subject-object coupling seems really important now, and so he writes, the quantum principle has demolished the view we once had that the universe sits safely out there, that we can observe what goes on from behind a one-foot thick slab of plate glass without ourselves being involved. We've learned that to observe even so minuscule an object as an electron, we have to shatter that slab of glass. We have to cross out the old word observer and replace it by a new word participator. In some strange sense, the quantum principle tells us we're dealing with a participatory universe. And he starts working on a little drawing. He wants to like represent this idea. Um, this is an early one where it's sort of like the guy punching through the, the glass, I guess. And he goes through several different versions. This one, he has like this U with the yin yang, and he's trying to decide if he should have these like beams of light coming off the one side, and then he says, yin yang, too busy. And he works through all these, and he finally settles on something like this. Um, so if you haven't seen this, this, the idea is that the U, it's a U. Um, the U stands for universe, and the top right-hand side of the letter is the origin of time and the Big Bang. And as you swoop down into the left, you're going forward in time, and the universe is expanding, and stars are forming, and um, they're forging carbon in their nuclear furnaces, and they're going supernova and spewing heavy elements out into the universe. And as we sort of make our way up the left-hand side, those heavy elements land on a rocky blue planet, and life emerges out of the primordial sludge and gives rise to this cyclops who opens its eye and looks back in time and through the act of quantum measurement creates the very universe that created it. So he calls this his self-excited universe. He writes, quantum mechanics has led us to take seriously the view that the observer is as essential to the creation of the universe as the universe is to the creation of the observer. But here's the thing. So Wheeler feels really strongly that community and colleagueship are like the essence, not only of good science, but of reality itself. He has a motto that he writes in the journals. He says, go everywhere, talk to everyone, ask anything. And he feels really strongly about interacting with other people. He works through his ideas and conversations with colleagues and students. Like Other people are extremely important to him. He writes, I've come to feel myself less of a person, more of a part of the stream of history. The individual is part of the society to which he belongs. My ideas come into being and ripen through conversations with friends and associates. Individual, what a wonderful idea, but how easy to take more seriously than it deserves. So when Wheeler draws this, he really means this. Like that single eye is supposed to be a stand-in for everyone's eyes for all subjects together, and he sort of envisions all of us together creating one and the same universe. So he really doesn't want something like Everett's universal wave function where you only have one observer in each world. He wants everyone in the same branch. But now that puts him right back to like the problem of multiple observers because quantum mechanics doesn't give us any way to make this picture sensible. So December 11, 1973, he's on a train and writes in the journal under the heading Partners Together in the Making of the World, how do we make a framework that extends from start of Big Bang to final collapse collaboratively? All of us partners in this construction, the worm and I, how do we share this responsibility? The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics talks along these lines but takes the machinery as for granted. Um, don't forget, in this connection, Bohr's words, we live suspended in language. Bohr emphasized so much language, speaking to one another. And so do I in these years. Could it be that language in action is the shaping hand? Seems ridiculous, but pursue. He says, is this world a misleading simplification for all our worlds? What these separate worlds are and how they fit together, the central problem. Lots of recognition circuits, not a universal one. That's honesty, and that raises the linkage, the issue of linkage, how to link, big buzzing confusion indeed. And a few days later, he writes, idea surely not new that there's not one world, but as many worlds as observers, and that meaning comes in the reconciliation of them, but how much reconciliation? And so you start to see him like going back and forth over this issue. January 27th, 1974, what happens when several observers are working on the same universe? 
So often when Wheeler had trouble sleeping, he would recite the Lord's Prayer to himself. And one night in January of 1974, he decided to write his own version of it. And what he wrote was, Dear ones of today and of times past and of time to come, we are participants together in shaping this great universe of ours. It shapes us, but we shape it. We are the products of history, but we also make history for ourselves and for others. We are the flower, our universe the flower case, brief the bloom in time, local in space, yet all that surround us, surrounds us in space and time has its part in the making of the bloom, flower case, and flower are one. So like in his prayers, it's like about multiple observers making one universe. February 13th, 1974, he's at a philosophy conference at Oxford, and he writes, after yesterday's lecture in Mind and Language series, I can believe that meaning is the joint product of all the evidence available to people who communicate, seems to give a desirable collectivity and standard that people meet but earthworms don't. Like that was his criteria, was that it has to apply to people and not worms. And shortly after, he's writing a letter to a philosopher, and he writes, the universe gives birth to observer communicators, observer communicators give meaning to the universe. So you see there, like, he, that I in the U diagram, it's not a single observer. Like here he's saying observer communicators, um, plural, and he's obviously still thinking about Bohr's solution of using language to solve this problem. Um, but in the same letter, he also mentions the common consciousness of mankind. So he's like trying to think about consciousness too. So you see him starting to like play with all of these possible solutions that people have proposed, none of which have, have worked out. Um, here you see his, he says, this is his like self-excited system again, but here he specifically expresses it in terms of consciousness. He says the universe gives birth to consciousness, consciousness gives meaning to the universe, and then beneath that, he has this quote from Bishop Barclay, no object exists apart from the mind. Um, but of course, that's a very solipsistic idea because the mind is fundamentally private and individual. But then he has this quote, meaning is the joint product of all the evidence available to those who communicate. So he's still hoping like communication is going to get us out of these private worlds and into some shared reality. August 23rd, 1974, is this measurement, the elementary quantum of meaning, uh, is this the place to grab hold and translate into numbers? On this view, the whole universe is brought into being, governed by, and derives its self-reference character from these acts of measurement and from them alone. One isn't making a measurement in this sense, and therefore a word other than measurement might be better, for example, participating, unless he acts as an agent for all the others. If he dies before he speaks, or doesn't speak, then he isn't participating, at least in that act of measurement. Question this view. The last one alive in his last days is no participator, but if he isn't, then the next to last man hardly contributes by communicating to him, and so on by extension all the way back. In brief, if everyone who can give meaning are fated to die, how can there be meaning? Um, which is quite an elaborate <laughs> way of looking at this. August 29th, 1974. Say to one another in plain language. This, again, is Bohr's phrasing. Stupid, bullhead way, but I see at the moment nothing better. No way to express in number form something about meaning is weight factor for each observation equal to number of consciousnesses to which the result of that observation has been communicated in plain language. Only out of such observations does the world as we know it take form to our minds. Um, October 18th, 1974, he's standing at the Port Authority bus terminal in New York City waiting for a bus back to Princeton. And he writes, need others to make it reasonable to be alive and conscious oneself. Otherwise, no picture of how I come in. As laws of physics are imagined on present view to be legislated by the requirement that the universe should have a way to come into being, so others and one's own life history are so legislated. February 2nd, 1975, Wheeler's in Seattle, and he writes, at lunch on Monday, I spoke to Pearls, I think that's how you pronounce it, about the question of the cordon sanitaire, uh, like solitary confinement, uh, that gives us a treatment of a system plus only one observer, 
Pearl said the analysis for one observer goes just as well for several. The result is something they can communicate to one another in plain language. If one is more complete than the other, the difference is not interesting. These remarks are immensely thought-provoking as to cooperation in bringing reality into being. So you just see him like kind of going in circles thinking about these things. Um, February 25th, 1975, he writes, several times last night and today I've had to ask myself about the universe as tied to each of us, each of us his own universe, and how the communication part of the quantum principle brings these several universes into coordination. The point needs special thinking and rethinking. Um, March 2nd, 1975, he's on a train from Vancouver to Seattle, and he writes, how could consciousness of the individual and consciousness of the collectivity be differentiated in their contribution? How can this contribution reach across time? Um, this one I sort of love. It's July 9th, 1975. Um, it's Whaler's birthday. So you can see in the margin he wrote age 64. Um, and he is at High Island, which is his like summer home off the coast of Maine. And he writes, what is this state function business anyway? Probability amplitude of someone observing something. How many somebodies? What about this super light velocity business of einstein rosen Podolsky experiment? Are we talking here of the most elementary example of people collaborating to bring the universe into being? They can collaborate well or poorly according as they set their polarization analyzers in correspondence or not. Can we spell this idea out in the framework of the wave function or do we need a more elaborate formalism? And who are the we that are involved? I talk of this writing being mine, but for it I have to thank the teacher in my first grade class in Washington, D.C., a few blocks south of where I lived with my grandparents and mother at 1105 Park Road Northwest, now torn down, while my father was in war library work. The eye is many they's. Consciousness, the focus of eye, is the eye of the hurricane of minute by minute decisions, which way to go. Where there is the role of consciousness in giving meaning, and how does one see the necessity of the quantum principle in the construction of the world? I keep going around and around the same circuit of questions, trying to find a way into the center of the mystery. Which is both beautiful writing and painful to think that this is what he's doing on his birthday. July 14th, 1975, he writes under the heading Strange World, on few issues in my life have I ever been more at sea than I am now on the relative weight of the individual and the collectivity in giving meaning to existence. Last night before falling asleep, I could not see how anyone could doubt it's the individual who gives meaning to existence. Where else except in my mind is the world I seek to explain. And then it a little while later, he changed his mind. How preposterous to think that each has to invent the universe afresh. Um, February 13, 1976, under the heading reality, he says, the einstein rosen Podolsky experiment is valuable, among other reasons, because it shows two observers participating in the making of reality. We are not concerned, as some are, with turning back from quantum mechanics, but with going on to two and more observers, two and more systems, two and more observations ultimately to see how the iron pillars and paper mache are combined to make reality. Um, okay, me and the universe. <laughs> uh, he says, I received a few days ago this paper, The Mind-Brain Problem as a Frontier of Science, and find it a bit confusing and would like to use this opportunity to grapple with the problem on my own, like the problem of consciousness. Observership can't be properly defined without a theory on this point. Um, in seminar Wednesday, 10th of March, 7.30 to 9 p.m., <laughs> Andrew Redfield claimed the wave function represents the state of our information about the electron, I agree, but that there's different wave function for each observer because each observer has different information, I disagree. If quantum mechanics is a magic clue to the great mysterious, it ought to be especially so on this aspect of observership. Um, so then he starts playing with this phrase, the combinatorics of observership. And this is like his, he wants to have a theory of how you add together everyone's contributions, how you weigh the value of each person's contribution. You know, if I measure something and die tomorrow before I can tell anyone, does my contribution not count? All these things. But around 1977, he starts to just give up on this idea of the consciousness plays a role in any of this. He still really wants a single world shared by multiple observers, um, but he can't see any way to make consciousness work that makes sense. 
And so his only resort, resort is to go back to Bohr's um, irreversible acts of amplification. That's what he sees as the, the remaining possibility. He writes in 1978 to a colleague, I've given up the idea that consciousness is any mystic magical element required for observation. I'm content with Bohr's statement that a phenomenon is brought to a close by an irreversible act of amplification, content with it as a starting point, not a stopping point. And in 1979, Wheeler's at a symposium at the annual um, conference for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he's on a panel with Eugene Wigner. And there's this really interesting exchange between them, and I'll just play you like a minute. I found the audio tape of this. Um, it's a little bit hard to hear, but what you're going to hear is Wheeler speaking, and then at some point, Wigner interrupts him. And you'll hear Wigner's the one with this beautiful Hungarian accent. And just pay attention to how Wheeler responds to Wigner, because it's sort of funny. It is the work of an observation to leave an indelible record, according to Colin Sante. My wonderful colleague, Eugene Wigner, argues that an observation is only then an observation when it becomes part of, quote, the consciousness of the observer, end quote, and points, quote, to the impressions which the observer receives as the basic entities between which quantum mechanics postulates correlation, end quote. For Bohr, however, the central point is not consciousness, not even an observer, but an experimental device, a grain of solar bromide, a Geiger counter, the retina of the eye, a device capable of, quote, an irreversible act of amplification. This brings, according to quantum mechanics, working with the other people. My colleague Eugene Baker points out that according to quantum mechanics, nothing is irreversible. And so what do we mean by an irreversible act of amplification? And this uh, is one of the mysteries about the quantum subject. <laughs> so Wigner says, there's nothing in quantum mechanics that's, irre that's irreversible. And Wheeler says, that's just the mystery of it. Like he, has, he really has no response to that. And it just sort of shows that like, after all this, like this is the only, the, the last remaining explanation that he has and yet, he still has no theory of how this is going to work. He's, he's not any closer to understanding how you can get a shared world if you can. Um, April 18, 1980, he writes, how are acts of observer participancy fitted together? That's the central mystery. What does contribute mean? What number expresses it? Bits we take in, this compared to bits in the world. Is there any point partway between all and none on this issue? Each of us a private universe? Preposterous. Each of us see the same universe? Also preposterous. So he's just stuck at this point. Whichever way he turns, he can't make sense of this multiple observer problem. And as you read through the journals, this, by the way, is a very small selection of it. It's painful. Like, he, I mean, he's just in such agony over this issue and, and really sees it as the central issue of fundamental physics. December 17, 1980, what troubles me more than anything else is how different observers combine their impressions to build what we call reality. July 22, 1981, mushy, 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 and out of that make hard reality. And to get from one to the other, need to transcend space, transcend time, and have billions upon billions of somethings all built on nothing. The irreversible act of amplification that brings a phenomenon to a close is the item I am miles and miles from having captured. That's the place from where the roots of Leibniz's monads have to reach out to touch all else of space and time. So he's miles and miles from having under any understanding of Bohr's phrase, and he refers to Leibniz's monads. And if you've never read Leibniz's monadology, I would recommend it. Um, it's this very enigmatic text, but a lot of people in physics and philosophy of mind um, have drawn a lot of inspiration from it. And the basic gist is Leibniz had this idea that the fundamental units of reality are these things called monads. And you can think of each one of them as like a self-contained perspective on the world. So it's not exactly a mind because it's a perspective of the world, but it's not exactly a world. So really, you can think of it as like an observer-observed pair. So Leibniz says, reality is made of all these monads. Um, and his phrase is, the monads have no windows. Um, so there's no way for any influence to get in or out. They're these completely self-contained, like solipsistic things. 
And yet, even though they can't have any causal impact on each other, Leibniz says there's a pre-established harmony that links them together. They sort of operate according to some universal law, and so they're each doing their own thing, but they're doing it in harmony. Um, and you can sort of think of Everett's branches of the universal wave function as being monadistic, except that in Everett's case, there's not exactly a pre-established harmony because the different branches are in contradiction with each other. Um, but it's just interesting that Wheeler's mind keeps going to these monads because they're like these inherently solipsistic things. And he says he needs a, the roots of the monads to reach out through space and time and connect. But it's this really sort of depressing image because the whole idea of a monad is that, that they can't do that. And he writes under the heading Observix, who does the observation? Collective. A trial thesis in words, all has to fit in a Leibnizian pre-established harmony. What observing does or participation is work the threads without destroying the structure. A certain minimum of threads of observation of participation is needed to have any universe at all. December 26, 1982. Feeling I'm wrong in looking for one meaning that would summarize and be built on the findings of all the observer participators that I've been concerned about for so long that the reaction of meanings here and meanings there back on actions here and actions there make up the show, yes, but can't be brought together in one meaning, one action. In support of and spelling out of this view, I now cite these quotes, which make me think it is conceivable we must give up on any one world view of physics. Man is no Aristotelian god contemplating all existence at one glance. And I think that's another way of talking about the fact that there's no third person perspective available in, in quantum mechanics. June 10th, 1983, the great issues, all built on information, but puzzle of puzzles, whose information? Flywheel of information, nothing real, about information only about act, or is act the name we give to something on which our information overlaps? And universe, what is it but the collection of all our acts? No, whose acts, seen by whom? October 1st, 1983, I can't make something out of nothing, and you can't, but together we can. Is that the way through? Um, I don't know if I have to read this whole thing. He's talking about solipsism. And he liked to quote um, Parmenides and George Barclay a lot, but they're both um, a little bit solipsistic. And so here he's like trying to say, Maybe there's ways of understanding them that's not solipsistic. Um, the heart of the matter is the word self. He says, we know that in the last analysis, there is no such thing as a self. There's not a word we speak, a concept we use, a thought we think, which does not arise directly or indirectly from our membership in the larger community. Um, on that community, the mind is as dependent as is the computer. A computer with no programming is no computer, and a mind with no programming is no mind. Impressive is the greatest computer program that man has ever written and run, but that program is nothing compared to the programming by parents and community that make a mind a mind. June 9, 1990. Who cares whether there are as many <laughs> existences as there are consciousnesses? Isn't it all terminology? That same month, one observer, never coupled, exchanging information with another, would seem to deserve no rating at all. And then this is, um, you may have heard this phrase, it from bit, that he's famous for, um, this idea that, that the fundamental units of reality are like bits of information and the, what we would call like a physical object, the it actually arises out of informational bits. Um, so he's been talking about this a lot at this point. But he says, about no feature of it from bit do I feel less comfortable than whose bit. This is March 25th, 1994. Three questions. How come existence, which really means how come there's such a thing as existence? Second, how come the quantum? And third, how come one world out of the perceptions of many different observer participators? February 22nd, 2005. He's now 93 years old. He says, nothing, nothing. You start with nothing to get everything. Everything is imaginary. It will certainly be imagining if we consider it so, but if enough others join us in the illusion, we will convert imaginary into reality. That imagination is held on track by communications from individual to individual and from generation to generation. 
that's how a law of conservation of matter takes form and that it, that is its foundation for what we call existence. Question and answer repeated often enough are the secret of it all. Be all alone and find yourself with no way to establish truth, reality, and existence. And on November 8, 2005, in the Meadow Lakes Nursing Home in New Jersey, he writes, if we are the ones who build the space time, how come we don't get as many space times as people? How come just one pursue further that one? And that's one of the last journal entries that he ever wrote. Um, this is a portrait of Wheeler that's hanging in Princeton, and this is him at his summer home on a high island, and he's writing in one of the journals, and I thought that's like, after reading through these journals, I realized how this is really the perfect way to capture him. Um, so, so Wheeler died ten, 10 years ago tomorrow, um, never having solved this problem, never finding a way to get multiple observers into one universe, and, and there's something tragic and painful about it, um, but we have to sort of ask, like, did he not succeed because he just couldn't figure out? Or did he not succeed because it's just not possible? Because nothing in quantum physics really hints at it being possible. It was just sort of this moral demand on Wheeler's part. Like, he just didn't want to live in a universe unless it was being constructed in tandem by multiple observers. And he reminds me a little of Einstein in that way, in the sense that, you know, he had this philosophical position and he, he wanted realism. And so he just, like, there were certain things in quantum mechanics he just couldn't accept and, and died trying to make physics conform to his own moral attitudes um, and, of course, you know, didn't have much luck. And in a sense, Wheeler did the same thing. Like, he fully accepted quantum mechanics and he was, in fact, this person who talked about the participatory nature of reality. But his demand for multiple observers fought against his own ideas because that's really a demand for realism. Um, any, any world that exists that all observers will agree on is essentially a world that exists independent of any particular observer. So, so they were both dying in the name of realism in this sense. And so what do we make of all this? Um, I mean, personally, I find it very hard to believe that quantum mechanics can incorporate multiple observers. I think the history sort of bears that out. But I think rather than dwell on this as a failure of realism, we should look at it as a kind of clue to how reality is constructed. And I can say that working as a writer covering what's going on in physics today, this issue has not gone away. And if anything, it's actually become more pressing lately. Um, and I won't go into this, but this is something we could talk about in the discussion if you wanted. Um, with physicists dealing with questions about like information loss and black holes and the so-called firewall paradox, if you've been following any of that, um, all of this comes back to this question of multiple observers and, and you have people thinking maybe the only way to solve these things and, and avoid violating laws of physics could be that you always have to restrict physical descriptions to a single observer no more than one at a time. And so just to wrap up, um, if I can be a bit speculative for a moment, um, I'll say a few words about the relationship to these ideas that we've been talking about and the foundations of cognitive science because this connection between the two is something I'm finding increasingly exciting. Um, so you could see already that people like Bohr, Heisenberg, Wigner, Everett, Wheeler were all bumping up against questions of cognitive science. And, and I think it's inevitable that you will bump up against them because if it's really true that quantum theory is a theory of the subject-object relation, and if those are fundamentally interchangeable labels, then cognitive science and fundamental physics are like two sides of a coin. Um, and so physics like tries to start with the object and then sort of to its surprise finds like, oh no, the object is like stuck to its subject and you can't um, disentangle them. And, What's happening in cognitive science is like you start with the subject and now we're sort of finding you can't actually disentangle it from its object. Um, so there's this really interesting symmetry and the standard view of cognitive science, like the so-called classical cognitivist view, which is really still like the mainstream today, is based on the idea of cognition as computation and perception as mental representation. So the idea is basically this. Like, when the man perceives the tree, there are really two trees. There's the tree that's out there in the world, which is sort of like a Kantian tree in itself. And this is fundamentally unknowable to the brain because neurons only know other neurons. 
Um, and then there's the second tree, which is the tree that the man perceives, which is a mental representation of the tree, which is in his own brain. So he is taking in information through his senses, he's converting it into neural activity, and somehow um, networks of neurons are making their best guess as to what's outside and creating this reconstruction as a mental representation. Um, so if you think of this like podium, like what the podium I'm seeing is my mental representation, the one you're seeing is your mental representation, and we are sort of all just going to like have the shared belief that there's actually, that those are copies of some original podium that none of us actually have any access to. It's sort of this mythical shared podium, <laughs> the kind of perfect invariant platonic object to which our imperfect private mental representations aspire. And, and that's the underlying foundational assumption of, of classical cognivism, that we know the world by copying it and recreating it inside our heads. And there's an analogy to be made here between classical cognivism and classical Newtonian physics. And so it's sort of like cognitive science is at the moment in, in a sort of Newtonian phase and just starting to, um, to come out of that. And so in classical cognitivism, it requires an object, right, like the tree or the podium that's neatly separated from its observer. It requires an observer who's neatly separated from the object that he observes. It involves a single object that's shared by all of us. Um, we each have our own like private versions of it, but we're assuming there's one shared one in the world. Um, and we're assuming that you can observe things passively without affecting them, you know, like you're standing behind Wheeler's plate glass window, um, just watching the world and passively representing it. Um, so, so classical cognivism is really not compatible with the ontology, or I think we should probably say epiontology, um, as Eric would put it, of quantum mechanics. And, and what's really fascinating to me right now is like there's this turn happening in cognitive science um, where people are starting to move away from this idea of mental representation as, as the basis of cognition. And they're generally not moving away from it because they're worried about quantum mechanics, because most of them aren't. Um, but just because it suffers its own kind of internal inconsistencies. Um, but these inconsistencies are like not unrelated to the ones that we saw in quantum mechanics. So for instance, the idea of representation only makes sense if there's some reference frame from which we can compare the representation and the represented. But there's no such reference frame that exists. Like, like, okay, we're looking at this slide and we see both trees. We see the mental tree and the physical tree and we can imagine that maybe this guy's like in an fMRI and we're seeing the neural networks lighting up in his brain at the same time that he's looking at the tree and we're like, okay, there's the representation in his brain and there's the real thing. But of course that's not true because if we zoom out, we're like, oh, we don't see the real guy in the fMRI and the tree. We're seeing our mental representation of that whole system. So we would have to ask someone else to compare our representation with the represented, and then you get into this <laughs> Wigner's friend, like infinite regress that arises precisely because there's no third person point of view available to anyone. Cognition is always in first person. So that gives rise to the same complications that it does in quantum mechanics. Um, and the very idea of like representation just doesn't make sense in any physical reference frame. And so because of this, um, and for more empirical reasons as well, cognitive scientists are starting to turn away from this idea of representation and into something more consistent with the subject-object coupling that we see in quantum mechanics. And this is sometimes called the E-turn because it encompasses a bunch of different approaches that all just happen to start with the letter E. So there's embodied cognition, extended, ecological, embedded, inactivist. An activist is sort of like the mother of them all. Um, this is a quote from The Embodied Mind, which is sort of like the original Bible of an activism. Um, and the authors write, now we discover we have no mind. After all, a mind is something separate from and knows the world. We also don't have a world, so there's neither an objective nor subjective pole. So instead, there's just like the relation between the two as the fundamental unit of reality. You can't separate them out. And so in activism, and it's all its variations in terms of embodied, embedded, and other e-name forms of cognition, 
is based on the same contextuality or relativity that we find in quantum mechanics, and it emphasizes the subject-object coupling that you're, that you're stuck with. Um, and when you remember Bohr's lesson about the blind man with the cane, this lesson that subject and object are, are arbitrary, interchangeable labels, this puts really interesting constraints on cognitive science. Um, so for instance, like we think of a subject's output onto the world being an action, and the subject's input from the world being a perception. Um, but if you can really swap those labels, then action and perception have to ultimately be the same thing. Um, there's this really interesting symmetry there, and so this plays into a lot of these e-name e approaches. Um, and so again, this is something we talk about in the discussion if you want, I won't like, go into any detail, but, um, but the point that I just want to leave you with is that this multiple observer problem suggests that, that quantum mechanics is only consistent in first person. And classical cognitivism and this whole idea of mental representation is inherently third person. And so it lives in tension with this nature of reality that's given to us by fundamental physics. And so if we think that cognitive science and fundamental physics are two sides of a coin, then to make them consistent with each other, um, we have to put cognitive science into first person. And that's what these inactivist uh, e-name approaches try to do. I'll just leave you with this quote from um, the philosopher Michel Bitbull. Um, he's sort of one of the few philosophers who's really paying attention to this connection. Um, he says, the similarities between the type of non-dualist theory of knowledge that Bohr and Heisenberg adumbrated and these non-representational theories of cognition are striking. This opens a potentially very fruitful research program of which we're presently witnessing the first outlines. So I find that like super exciting and I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, and when I think back to Wheeler and like the way he agonized over this multiple observer problem, I'm struck by the fact that like, even though he never solved it, he was once again like, very ahead of his time in realizing that like, this was the central question that needed to be addressed, and it, not only in fundamental physics, but also in cognitive science. So, uh, Thank you guys so much, and I look forward to the discussion. So that's the, like where he says, like, I believe the, the wave function is about knowledge, but not that different observers have different, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can just, I'll remind you what it said. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so he said somebody, uh, Andrew Redfield, I think, had said um, that, I believe the, the wave function represents the state of knowledge about the electron, not the electron itself. And, then he, and he said, I agree. And then he said, but Redfield went on to say, therefore, different observers must have different wave functions because they have different knowledge. And he said, I disagree. Um, right, I think that's the essence of this whole problem in a way because, because that's where it doesn't make sense. Like you can't have, you can't have that both ways, right? Like, um, I think the issue is, I, I think really he, it was like a moral thing. Like he, he just could not accept the idea that reality isn't profoundly shared. Um, so it's like, it's like he saw that there was clearly like something epistemological about the wave function, but he just, refused to go so far as to say, therefore, it's it's in, it's unique to a given observer. Yeah. yeah, but in some sense, I mean, it resolves a lot of problems, right? Like, for example, one thing I want to point out, Dietner and his friend already agreed upon the basis, right? In some sense, the cat is dead or not. 
I mean... They don't, though. I mean, he knows that the, there's a basis which is... The oh, either dead alive. or alive. Yeah, sure. Right? So yeah. in some sense, they already shared some information. And the whole thing right. resolves once Vigna tells his friend, well, the cat's dead, right? I mean, they're, once they share information, then the whole problem is, like, at, on this level, at least resolved, right? So, I, I mean, I think there are some information theoretical approaches to this whole problem. And I don't know enough to really go into detail, but maybe you... Well, I think part of the reason that that Vigner and Vigner's friend just talking about it doesn't do what we want it to do is because it's like you're thinking about that as if you're like this third person point of view watching them have this conversation. But you always have to be in some point of view. And so... So whatever it really like was emphasizing is like any communication between two observers is one observer making a measurement on the other. So if Vigner, if Vigner's friend, they meet up and he says, hey, wh what was the state of the cat? He's making a measurement on Vigner. And so his measurement outcome of whatever Vigner says is like relative to him. So there's no, there, you're still not in like a point of view where you you can see any agreement between them, if that makes sense. Like, you're still either in Vigner's point of view or Vigner's friend's point of view, or the point of view of someone watching the two of them. But but then you're you're just in that guy's point of view. So it's like, if you if you accept the idea that the subject and object are defined in relation to one another you always have to say who the subject is. And so even in a, in a conversation, the subject has to be somebody. It can't be like this God's eye view of that conversation. And so, and, and because the measurement outcome is still quantum mechanical, it's like every communication is still governed by those laws. I mean, it's, it's like hard to think about, but, um, but that's, that's whatever it was really emphasizing and, and um, people like Chris Fuchs and Carlo Velli, who will be talking um, in this in this lecture series, um, they talk a lot about this. So those are good things to talk with them about too. But this issue of of first person, that like the impossibility of a third person perspective, um, does that make any sense? Yeah, but I, well, I see the problem with like so there are some objects I don't, can't know everything about. Um, no, no one can know everything about this object, right? So, but me communicating about it basically, so, so I would say like observe independent uh, facts about the thing are not there, then I don't have a problem, right? Right, but if you want observer independent facts, okay, yeah. then yeah, there's a problem. Then, then, <laughs> right. So, but this is the axiom, right? There are observer independent facts, and therefore I have to assume that there is some kind of third person view which can verify whether this is correct or not, right? Yeah, except that there isn't that point of view. So I think the, the implication there would be that there's not observer independent facts. Yes, that's what, I, what okay. I would say. Okay. Then, then I don't have so much of a problem. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But there is one which is related to this is uh, uh, did we ever think about the question what is meant by just one observer? Because when I observe something and then I then I then the time passes and I'm somebody different or I, am I not different? So what is what is the, uh, the term of permanence? Is, is it somewhere there yeah. or, or not? Because maybe we were ten years after is more different than some of his pupils 10 years after yep. judging more than we were <laughs> right. and, 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 and this can be squeezed uh, in time. And so what does it mean, one observer? Yeah. Is this, is, isn't this much too idealistic? It's a really interesting question. And he does, there's a journal entry where, that I, don't, I didn't show, but where he's having a conversation with somebody about this issue. And the person says to him, well, what's the difference between multiple observers and the same observer over time? Same thing. So it's, and he, he didn't know the answer, and he was like, oh, that's really interesting. So I think 
I think he didn't go deep enough into that. I think that's like a really interesting question because, I mean, he thought a lot about time and, and you know, he had like the delayed choice experiment was his and, and this whole idea with the you, like looking back in time. Like, so he really thought like time is like transcended in some way and that like, so, so he tried to, I don't know, work outside of time almost, but I think, I think that question, it depends on, it calls into question what the definition of the observer is, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know if you can, yeah, I don't know what the answer is, yeah. <laughs> First, I have a, a comment on the, the comparison that the boils because with the similarity between GR and, yeah. and, and quantum mechanics. So, I think there is a, a bit of difference in the sense that it's easy to say everything is relative also relative. Right, right. You, you have that you can't have a, an objective reality right. uh, observer independent, but it's always. But in, in, in relativity, you have a difference that you have a yeah. clear rule on how to compose right. different observations. Yeah. Whereas here, you're just saying that they're different, but you don't know how to compose them. So right. these pairs of uh, are going with different observers, so pairs of, of objects, subjects. Yeah. You have to find a, a rule to compose yeah. observations, otherwise, it's this point. I mean, you can't right. have uh, intersubjectivity. We are just right. trapped in a world where. There is nothing that we can share. Yeah. I think that's the problem. I think, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like, Chris Fuchs has a, a great way of expressing this where he says, like, in relativity, one observer can look over the shoulder of the other. Like, yeah. that, yeah, exactly. Like, you have mathematical transformations that you can make from one reference frame to another. And so, and the reason that you can do that in GR is because there is something invariant, which is like this, the four dimensional space time. So, there are things that are going to change from reference frame to reference frame, but there are things that, that won't, and you have these rules of how to figure out what's what. Um, and I think what they're, all these guys are struggling with is like their, quantum mechanics doesn't give you that rule. And so it's like, is quantum mechanics only applying to one observer, or do we just have we not found the rule yet? Um, and I think that's kind of like an open question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you said Kant's view, yeah. yeah. Um, the thing is, is like, if you take as a premise subject and object are interchangeable labels, then Kant would be sort of putting the subject first. Like, you don't want one to come first, right? So Kant would be saying, there's some, you're starting with some, um, perception, you know, of space and time or whatever it is, um, and, and you're imposing that on the world, but it's like that that comes first. And so that in itself implies that you can talk about the subject independent of the object. And so I think if you're trying to be truly relational about it, um, you, can't, you can't attribute any features to the subject that you wouldn't to the object, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> just pointing out, like, just if Wigner puts his bread in this lab, right, he can still look over his shoulder. I mean, I'm, I understand that it doesn't solve the problem, but I, I just point out that, like, what is an observer which was after us there yeah. is very, very hard to define. Like, sure. They just put two people in the same lab, they look at the screen or they look in the box at the same time, they still, like, see the same result, right? But according to who? <laughs> because like there's still, I mean, you, you can take this to different levels, but I think if you're being like logically 
rigorous and annoying about it, which I will be, um, that you still have to be in one of their points of views. And like maybe they don't see the, like they could be right next to each other and not see the same thing. And who would know is the question. As long as any given observer's um, measurement outcomes are consistent with one another, like as long as if I say the cat's alive and then I ask the person next to me, do you see an alive cat? They better say yes. But that just means that all of my measurement outcomes are consistent. It doesn't actually mean I know what they're seeing. So thank you. Fake news. That's again the question. Since we spoke of communication, yeah. at, at some at some uh, at some stage, we arrived at this this issue of communication, mm -hmm. and um, so so one science which you mentioned is cognitive science, but there are others uh, yeah. like semiotics, for sure. example, yeah. uh, who also deal with this. And one issue there is uh, that uh, so what, what you what you wrote there with the, with the tree and the image of the tree is yeah. more or less this very simplified triad <laughs> of course of this triad yeah. 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 more or less uh, as a sign signifies and this, the signifier and so on. But but anyhow, uh, one issue with this with this with with this communication is that uh, uh, one possibility of defining uh, a code. Because you have to have some some way of, of communicating. Mm -hmm. Is that, that uh, anything that you can lie with can be considered as a sign? So the next question which arises out of this is uh, what about the issue of deception uh, here in, in in the course of communication? How can you decide uh, whether this is what you think of it, right. it is, or if it is just deceiving you? And, 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 and how to go out of this? Was this also a question of wheelers, or, or is he still sticking to this? Okay, we have here kind of logical issues, which are again not very clear in this right, context right. what this should mean. So we arrive at some kind of truth, which which is which is non-subjective anymore. But right. but he goes to this communication issue right. where we have. Exactly the issue of fake news. Right. Uh, which we which we mentioned. So how do we distinguish between uh, fake or non-fake news in this in this yeah. domain of, of quantum uh, quantum issues? Yeah, it's a super interesting question. So as an aside, Wheeler does get very into purse, but um, but not in terms of the semiotics. He gets very interested in, in purse in terms of the idea that that the laws of physics could change over time and that there's this sort of evolutionary thing. Um, but he he tries to like link a lot of these things together. But um, I think, well, it's funny. It's like, so uh, part of what I'm saying here is like Wheeler had this certain moral attitude that sort of colored everything he did. And I think part of that attitude is like, I don't think it would have even occurred to him that people would lie to each other. Like, I think he like thought well of people. Um, so I don't think he actually asked that question, but I think that question, it, it points out like another flaw in the idea that like if we rely on communication to create a shared reality, like right, like how reliable is it, and like how can we really call that rea reality? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Slightly changed. I noticed that um, Wheeler is is is. Meant, is um, using the, the the word the meaning several times. Yes, that, yeah. That, like the, the observer attributes the meaning to the universe yeah. and the other way around. And I've seen several positions in shows. So if you had if you can give a glance at what does it mean for him the, yeah. the meaning because it's a very hard historically very hard word yeah. also in the in the philosophy of, of science is meaningful and what is meaningless. Yeah. I think, yeah, for sure. I mean, so he he was going to some philosophy conferences when he was like dealing with all this, and I think he was he got very interested in this idea of what is meaning. And so, um, so someone at one of the Falstall, I think, someone at one of the conferences said, "Meaning is the joint product of those who communicate." And so Wheeler sort of latched onto that definition of, of meaning. Um, but 
But then he would get into these questions of like, okay, can you calculate that? Like, again, like there would be a case of like, maybe you can, if you're using statistics, you can sort of ignore the, the concern about people lying because if you just take enough people, the, you can just assume that you'll get something um, meaningful out of it or you get the truth out of it. But um, yeah, I mean, he, he talked a lot about like, He, he used the phrase meaning circuit a lot, that somehow the observer, by making an observer, observation, not only like creates the reality, but imposes meaning on it. Um, and I don't, I don't know if he ever came to terms with exactly what that meant, but he was, he was definitely interested in that as a term and interested in the like philosophical implications of it. He was very, I mean, many people would say like the old Copenhagen school or, or some verbalization of it, they would say that the observer creates somehow the reality of the, the result and he, he was very careful not to use this, uh, yeah. not to attribute the actual ontological status through through observations, yeah. but attributing meaning that is, so right. must, have, must have thought the difference between the, the Well he, there was, a, there was one point in the journals where he was um, going to the hospital to have heart surgery. And he said, like, in case I don't make it, here's like my one final sentence on, on physics. <laughs> and he said, something of an information theoretic character is at the bottom of everything. And so I guess if you really think that the ontology is information, then there's like, then meaning has, well, I don't know if it has to come into it, but could come into it in some, sense. So, right, it's like you might not be creating a physical world, but you're structuring it to have a certain meaning in some way. But it's interesting, like, the, you mentioned the Copenhagen interpretation, and, like, I don't think Bohr, like, from everything I've read of Bohr, I don't have the impression that he thought we create reality. I think he really just thought it was this relational yeah, thing. Yeah, some Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> to trust that their perception, I mean, but then that gets into the cognitive science side too, which is interesting. But yeah, I mean, I think like when Bohr talks about like an unambiguous language, I mean, like what's an unambiguous language? Like math or, you know, logic or binary code or, you know, like it's so maybe you get down to information that way, but, but yeah, exactly. I don't think it solves the problem. I think it raises the same questions. Yeah. I have a question just tapping into that. Yeah. Um, basically, do you think that uh, a subjective agent could be somehow quantified, like what kind of things it can do to the world, and therefore you could create some kind of mathematical transformation law of what information means to me, and then I translate it to what to another subjective agent that what information could mean? Because you always have the problem, like also in the classical communication theory, that you have a sender and a receiver, and they have different representations, and they have to agree right. on a certain way of communicating. Right. It's such an interesting. I mean, I don't. I don't know the answer. Um, I. One thing that's really interesting is like so in in these like e approaches to cognitive science, um, because they they 
understand perception not as like some passive thing, but as like you acted on the world and this was the result, um, they would say that to communicate to someone else your perception, you can't actually just like describe the thing you saw, you have to describe what you did. And so they would have to be able to perform the same action to get the same perception. Okay. And so then if, if you could imagine that there's some mildly deterministic way in which certain actions always lead to certain perceptions, then I think, I think you'd still always be stuck in first person, but you could at least imagine mathematically that there could be some same way to do that. that. Have the feeling that I translate to another subject. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's like, so one of the things Wheeler got really obsessed with, he had this phrase like the boundary of boundary is zero, um, which is sort of just a, just a point about like um, geometry, but he, he took it to mean Essentially, like if, long story short, if everything was nothing, which it was an idea he kept going back to, and then you put a boundary on the nothing and called one side subject and the other object, any dynamics across that boundary would be constrained by the fact that it has to all add, up, add back up to nothing. So that like all, he basically wanted to say all of the laws of physics, all the conservation laws arise as ways of conserving nothing. But, so if you could like get to that, then maybe there, it's almost like maybe that could provide that Leibnizian like harmony of like there's some, fundamental constraint on the dynamics between subject and object, such that if you had two subjects that were like structurally similar and performing the same actions, that they would maybe get similar results. I don't know. I'm just making things up. Again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, building up on this, but this is a question that they did he also concern, was, was he concerned that that's, that's what probably was asking us? The way we look at things is actually the product of, of kind of schooling for the school to look at the things the way you look. So neuropsychology, so Luria as mm -hmm. teachers of all the sex gives these examples of people really couldn't understand logical, simple logical deductions. Yeah. Uh, so, so is, is, this is also part of the subject that, that he has, has interacting with other subject, which we will also obviously uh, says that this, this is true. So he, he somehow belongs to a kind of school of looking at things, yep. a school of per, of proceeding. Yes. Yep. So how can you get out of this of this problem? How can you say because physics is so it's, you know, objective? Absolutely. Right. Whoever looks at these things will see the same. Right. Because the laws say that it has to be the same. But if we say that a certain kind of communication plays a role, mm -hmm. then, then we have to, to have the, 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 the results of the people who are dealing with communication only with this to say that of course you will be a school to look at the things the way it looks so. So we say, okay, when you have five years of physics, you will see this in this <laughs> right, like right. experiments. Before yeah. this, I don't know what to see, but it yeah. doesn't interest me as well. Yeah. So how can we get out of this? I, yeah, I mean, he he thinks about that a lot. Like, And you can, you can take that to different levels. Like, two people that are schooled differently, two people that speak different languages. Um, <laughs> A person and a worm, like you can, like as far as you want. Um, he in his journals, like he had articles about like animal consciousness, and and then he would say, well, like as a thermostat, does that count as an observer? You know, like and he would just sort of keep trying to push it. Um, so yeah, I don't know how you get out of that. I mean, I guess if you if you're being sort of solipsistic and restrict it to one observer, then you don't have that problem. <laughs> but 
but then you have just, just to yeah on this, uh, the, the way that, that there is an attack on the solid system is uh, the raging bull attack so if the solid system is confronted with the raging bull <laughs> he will uh, run away yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so somehow uh, that must be ready so so is is the issue of, of uh, if, if if you try to to, to to generalize this, is the issue of technology or of engineering playing a role here. Because when we are able to make, I don't know if, if we are right. politically incorrect, that gun and kill somebody right. by this, what we get out of our subject, object, or whatever <laughs> right. it is, yeah. uh, ideas, isn't this a kind of, of proof of some kind of I don't know, objectivity, it's just, I, I have no idea. It's, 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 isn't engineering a kind of proof of, 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 of reality? It's tricky because, so, so if you, if you take this sort of solipsistic view, you want to be careful to not think that that means you're imagining the world because you, you, you're just as relative as you're, Perceptions and so and and again, like you want to always be able to flip subject and object and have everything still make sense. And so, so if the bull's coming at me, it might not be objectively real in an invariant multiple observer way, but it's as real as I am. So if I care about me, I have to move, right? Um, but so I don't know because I think anything. I mean, again, this is like annoyingly pedantic, but it's like anything you could do in your own reference frame, even by creating technology, whatever, like it would all make sense within your model of the universe, but it's still not clear like how that's connecting you to other people. Yeah. Right. I think it's worse because I think it's the same in the fact that you could just, no matter what, you can doubt everything. But if if you wanted to say somehow, like even though I can doubt everything, like physics can somehow give me some insight into how the world actually is, and what quantum mechanics is saying is because you can't decouple the observed from the observer, you can't talk about how the world really is. You can only talk about how the world is related to the observer. Like, you can only talk about that relation. And so... Um, but there's still the, 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 the thought of the thing that, that there is something like that. That could be sure that there is something that I observe. That is not from the... Like, because um, there's this that I cannot really communicate about it because it would be like a measurement, like the communication right. itself. Yeah. But, um, but then I cannot really be sure that like, the information I get in the first thing I do like, is actually the, the thing. The right. Thing. Well, so in a way, like, Cogito ergo sum, in, in this view of quantum mechanics, it's like the ergo sum that's like problematic because you're, you're, you're thinking of a subject coming first there still. Um, and so if you really push this relational view, you almost, you can't even say that. Um, so I, I don't know, it feels worse to me, but, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Following up on this question, mm -hmm. um, I, I also research, like, I don't understand why, like, yeah. why is this quantum mechanics? Like, a box doesn't make a system quantum mechanical, right? If I have two bolts, a red and blue, and I just put two glasses and I move them around, the right. fact that I forgot where is the, that they don't know where is the red and where is the blue doesn't make them quantum, because there is no... I mean, the main feature of a quantum system is that, that there must be some coherence between the two states, and I must be able to rotate them coherently. And right, right, right. So if I just put a... I, I, maybe this is in line with what you were saying. If I just put a box 
and then I am the regular friend outside. There is no type of coherence between the system. I mean, yes, of course we can write an equation where we put the system that decayed and me aware of the fact that it decayed and not decayed and me aware that it decayed. Right, well, that's what he's doing, right. yeah. I take them together. Like, I, I mean, I can't, I, I cannot, if I give you an entangled state, and, and I have a horizontal and a vertical in superposition with vertical horizontal yeah. polarization, for example, then the measure, the type of measurement that you do matters because because it's gonna make it, make the other right. particle collapse correspondingly. But you can also rotate it, and this will still work. Right. But if I cannot coherently manipulate my system because because one of them is intrinsically classical. I mean, where's the quantumness? This is what they don't understand. Well, I think this is starting with an assumption that nothing's inherently classical, right? I mean, so you can... So can I rotate Wigner's friend coherently with the system? In practice or in principle? In... in, <laughs> in I think in principle you'd have to say yes. I mean, in pra so in that setup, because you're you're correlating everything with the superposition of the particle, like I mean, in general, like all you have are are correlations, right? And so it, you can have decoherence where the those get so scrambled that, like, in practice, of course, you can't manipulate or even observe those those um, coherences anymore because they're so spread out. But but they're not gone in principle. I mean, they're just spread, right? You know what I mean? I mean, like, so, like, essentially, what you're saying is like the decoherence could give you like an actually classical world. Um, but I, but I, but, but that's like an observer-dependent like question, right? Because it's like what's happening in decoherence is you, these correlations are just getting scrambled into the environment. But if you take the whole environment as the system, like they're still there. So it's nothing like the quantum system doesn't like become an actually classical system. It just becomes like harder to track, right? Yeah. <laughs> But like, but according to the formalism, when you make that measurement, you're just entering your own state into those that correlation. So, so you're just become like there's nothing in the formalism that tells you you can stop there and it's no longer quantum. Like, like what you're saying is obviously very true in practice. But like, if you're just asking these like foundational questions um, where you want to just say like deeply in principle. Um, the idea is that essentially when you, unless you're thinking like when you make a measurement that you're actually like collapsing wave function or something, but if you, if, but again, that's like adding something onto the formalism. So if you're just taking formalism and saying there's just observers entering into correlations with their measurement outcomes, then you're just taking these coherent superpositions and spreading them out and like adding things on. But then what could be the difference between a unitary operation and a measurement? I mean, if I Nothing, I mean, that is... that. a superposition, but if I do a measurement, there is some form of collapse in reality, right? Well, this depends on your interpretation. So, if if you, so I'm I'm I'm. <laughs> if you wanted to say it's it's always unitary, then there's no collapse and you're just entering into a correlation. If you want to say you're breaking unitarity, that's fine. But I think then you need that's adding something on that's like not in the formalism itself. So if you if you if you take unitarity to be fundamental, then then there's just no way to draw a line and say 
at this point, everything's classical and not quantum anymore. <laughs> All right, another question. Um, I actually have comments to both of you. Yeah. Because, okay, um, I think it's very important that we like, think about axioms and then go on what theory it does. For me, this is worse because the Kogito and Sum actually comes before, right? I, we all, have, like, for me, if there is a world outside of myself, it's like a question I can't decide. But I assume it because I live in this reality and I kind of want to make sense of it. And then comes my physical theory trying to explain this world which I just assumed to be there, right? And so this coming to episode is the question whether there is a world or not. And I say, okay, I can't decide. But now assume this is reality, let's try to find something like a consistent description of this world and like try to find like a way of communicating about it. And even this is kind of fucked up, right? Oh, I don't know if this goes on the internet. Yeah, but, <laughs> um, so there's this problem. And then we come actually directly to you, because the point is like, it depends on whether you assume quantum mechanics to be basically the foundation of the reality or a description of the reality, right? Mm -hmm. So like, if you assume it is the description, then you have to see and just go at the theory and see what what it tells you. And I don't know, Professor Bruckner just wrote the paper on Peter's friend. I don't know if you read it yet. Oh no. no. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And he writes down. He basically does bad inequalities for this quantum state oh. of the laboratory, and um, he comes up with like four. Uh, axioms which cannot be at the same time, similar to Bell and Bell okay. qualities. And one is uh, observer independent facts, um, what was the second? Quantum mechanics on any scale, that's your point, right? So if quantum mechanics is true on all, every scale, and uh, then there was uh, freedom of choice and mm -hmm. locality. 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 Okay, so there we have four. Yeah. And you cannot have all four of them at the same time right. and uh, fulfill this, this, or like be consistent with quantum mechanics. Yeah. So, like, taking these four and like thinking of this and this axioms, and you see, like, if you say, okay, for me, like, it's not scalable in all, all length, fine, good, right? For me, like different things that I say, okay, one observer and you kind of facts are not not real, so I'm good. You both can go. Right, right. <laughs> um, like so, so I think it's really good to see what we assume and what we go to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. So I do have an open question to everybody which is here right now, and maybe could be also seen as a commentary to that, but. To me, when, when, when we born, we try to communicate in some sort of communication systems or just words and sentences and so on. We're trying to make sense of our outer world in some senses that we are told to understand the world in that sense. So it means that everything that I know about the world around me are the words that I somehow learn or are the things and experiences that I make through the course of my life. Well, I do believe that, as um, I had spoken to uh, Professor Tsaiyu for about maybe two and a half hours, uh, two years ago, that the sort of language that they're using is just failed because the language that we human have is a sort of um, except theoretical saying that one, one by one word to, uh, from one sentence to one word. So that means that if I do have a cell phone here, I have to have, a, have an experience of it. So then I can make sense of what it is. But all sort of language that we're using today in our quantum interpretations are doomed because it has nothing to do with human experience. So we can make sense of experiences by making measurements and trying to measure something, calculate something. And it comes right away to your question because I was trying to make sense of the question, but you are speak to fundamentals that are that we learn and getting out of that 
I don't see any way to getting out of those fundamentals that we are trying to describe the world on the basis of those fundamentals. I think more or less just to stay short that the human language need another step to make sense of what a kind of quantum world or what we say at a blah blah world could really mean to us. So I think back to the 1920s, to the time of the Wittgenstein, we are failed and doomed because of the failing in the communication. There is no philosophical questions because there are no philosophical issues. This is just a game of words. So we have to first of all set up a very firm sort of language for that. Because when you try to um, speak about a trajectory and a double slip experience, and those one one to one trajectory does not really exist, those sort of language is doomed and failed. So how can I really speak to you, to all of you, to make sense of what the quantum world should look like? Should be a unitary operator, should be some kind of other operator, or any kind of measurements. That was long short country and also a question. <laughs> Don't you think that we need another step just by looking on how to communicate? Maybe we need another system of com communicating to each other rather than asking questions. Sorry, wasn't wrong. Well, one thing I can say about that, well, two things I can say about that. One is like, so Bohr, I think, thought a lot about that issue. He had this phrase like, we're suspended in language, like we're, we can only formulate our ideas about reality in terms of the language that's available to us. And then, you know, he had this, like the correspondence principle where he, he really emphasized that like our language is classical and therefore like the outcomes of measurements have to be expressed classically even though they might be quantum in and of themselves or something. Um, I think one thing that's interesting, and this is um, maybe going too far outside of what you're saying, but in these embodied approaches to cognition that I was referring to, um, they would say that language is, ends up being um, like a, a higher level motor function. And so there's nothing that's in our language that isn't first in our bodies and our interactions with the world. Um, so we sort of think of language as being this incredibly abstract thing. Um, but they would say that it's not, that at bottom it comes from our understanding of the physical world and how we move in it and how we interact with it. And so in that sense, there wouldn't be such a tension between the language and, and what we're talking about in physical reality because it would, the language would have come from that, if that makes any sense. So that might be one approach. Now, in fact, to the quantum system, so we can consider it as an overall quantum system. 
But, but if I take the, the two balls, the two balls under the, the, the glasses, I would say it is classical. So should I always relate to the history of the system to decide whether it's quantum or classical, or everything is quantum? But then why? <laughs> I mean, why there are, okay, maybe I'm going to say, but like why then certain theories do not speak with each other when you actually look at different scales? I mean, if everything was quantum. Well, I mean, the point is quite that maybe the, like, okay, so it's class, the description is classical because it kind of works, right? Like, Newtonian mechanics kind of works, but still everything is relativity. I mean, it, I just use Newtonian mechanics because it's so accurate that I can't decide. I mean, this is a very interesting thing as well, of precision and world and what it means and yeah. how far can we go. But like, if you say that, like, okay, this is classical, and I'm asking you whether your description is classical, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the system itself is, is classical, right? I could describe it as quantum mechanics with a lot of um, decoherence, and I'm fine, right? It's, it's not a problem. Yes, but in this case, we read maybe the example of Newtonian mechanics with generality. Let's apply the same reasoning to the case of the balls. We agree that even if I don't have the knowledge of quantum mechanics, I can describe well the system of the two balls under the glasses, right? Yes, but if you have Newtonian mechanics, you can have, you can have this conversation afterwards as well. Like, if you have Newtonian mechanics to describe this cup falling down, it's no problem, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's totally agree. So, these two balls I can describe, although I don't use quantum mechanics, I can describe it still well. Instead, the inner friend, we say, okay, no, I cannot describe this thing well because I need to take into account that there are certain relations, right? Because the, there was there was no this collapse. I feel very anxious. <laughs> there is one more question. So just a short comment. Ah, okay. <laughs> so can you make a measurement? No, classically, you cannot. So that's, that's the, 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 the issue is that, that uh, actually in order to make to make a measurement you need classical setup. So that's 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 the whole point. I yeah. think you, you cannot you, there are, there is no quantum mechanical measurement. You have also no. every yeah, but, but this uh, you have it. Uh, so you, you you need a classical measurement. Get indirectly so, so. I, <laughs> I think with the balls under the cups, the idea is like you can use classical physics. It's what you were saying. You can use classical physics because. Anything, anything you're going to measure in that situation, that that's going to be totally sufficient, um, and you would have to look so incredibly closely, and it would be so complicated to see it as a quantum system with a ton of decoherence. But the Wigner's friend, it's not that that's it, that's not fundamentally different than the cup scenario. It's just that because you're tying it to the the state of the particle at the bottom, that you're just making it more obvious that that even at these large scales, like technically at bottom, it's a quantum system. But yes, normally, like you, you could use classical language and classical physics to like describe it. And because you would have to look so incredibly closely to, to see any quantum effects. Is that, yeah. <laughs> we can keep going, yeah. <laughs> right, that's the last comment. Yeah. <laughs> so, if I give you a system, you wouldn't know whether you can describe it classically or quantum, right? So you kind of have to assume, or like, let's take um, relativity, right? I give you some object and it's, it's flying by, right? Like, how would you know whether your classical description of this particle is accurate enough, right? So you first make your relativity, and then you see, oh, well, it's like under 10 percent so fine. So, so, I mean, and if I give you balls and I don't tell you whether these balls are quantum or not, you don't know if you can describe them classically. So when you do that, then you actually make a fantasy, right? But I can still describe them good enough, like... But you assumed already that you can describe them classically. Okay. <laughs>
then you choose to go deeper into the content description and maybe you describe actors and other things. So I don't understand what that means. That you the have a, a way to class, see. Classical, me classical mechanics is an approximation of the, the same equation of uh, recursives. So you can just take the formula, the, the old set of, of uh, equation of, of recursivity. And in, some, in a certain limit, you can impose a certain limit of, of velocity and calculate the discrepancy between the two. In classic, in, in, in quantum mechanics, it's much more blurry. You yeah. can say, okay, I have many many particles, maybe I should describe it in classic because I can't. But you can still see from the result. It says that maybe you should just have a description and you don't describe it. And then maybe you use quantum description. Exactly. You don't, exactly. it. You don't, you don't quantify how much you're quantum and how much you're not quantum. Yeah, you they don't get fresh papers. Yeah, you, you have a top that, okay, it shouldn't be quantum or not. Yeah, but that, that's the whole point of the experiment, right? I mean, to figure out what are the limits of quantification, say quantum mechanics is that thing, right? I mean, let's say it's not a complete theory in the sense that. You can actually connect it to all the rest of the theories. In fact, to quantum gravity, why not? You should be. The, the right theory should do that, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I agree, but this is not contra the point of, of the explanation in some sense, right? I agree that you kind of can't fit this limit, but if I give you an object, like you would rather take the theory which is can describe more things than the one which can't, right? Quantum mechanics cannot describe any microscopic objects so far. You have to assume that the imposed label here, for instance, it doesn't it can be superposed. So you, you have to assume this. And and you can postulate that no, it's actually holding but you don't see it, but it, you never see it. So you don't have an experiment that shows quantum mechanics in the microscope. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to comment? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I I sort of agree with what everyone's saying. Um, I think it's interesting because right, it depends. Like, are you is your criteria for using a theory like ease of use or most fundamental? Um, and I guess that's like a choice to make. Like, you could probably say in a situation where. Planck's constant is small relative to the scale of what I'm looking at, and there's a large, messy environment. Like, you could set up criteria to say, probably this is where I should be using classical physics, and quantum physics is going to be much harder to use. But to me, what's sort of more interesting in principle is just like, if, if there's one that's like always right, and there's one that's only sometimes right, to me, the always right seems the better. <laughs> But quantum mechanics, I mean, but you, you but you could imagine how you could see it. It's just in practice you can. I mean, I was just saying, like you're saying, like. There's certain systems where you can't say that quantum mechanics like could describe it, but like, I mean, you you could, right? You're just talking about like an, it, it would just be incredibly complicated. It, it's like you know if you talk about information loss in physics or something, and the example that a lot of people give is like if you burn, if you take an encyclopedia and you throw it in a fire and you burn it, and you're left with a pile of ashes is the information gone? And the answer is no. It's not gone the way it would be like in a black hole or something. It's, it's there. It's just so beyond scramble that like, in any practice, you're not going to be able to put it together. But you didn't like literally remove, um, you didn't break any conservation laws in doing it, right? So, so with quantum mechanics, you could say, OK, there's a system where to, for me to track the coherences, like how they're spread out in the environment, would just be like computationally impossible. But I don't think that means the theory doesn't apply. It just means it's not useful. Yeah, I think one, one, one can support the, the view that it doesn't apply. Just that this scale, you know, so you have a certain peculiar uh, uh, features of quantum mechanics, like entanglement, right, right. and 
you do experiments, you get into a certain superposition, you don't see it. So you say, okay, quantum mechanics doesn't work here. So I can't superpose this 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 plot, this paper. No. But there are <laughs> and obviously, I mean, I think that many people thought it, especially in the beginning, uh, I, I think in, in, including Borg, said in, in certain uh, works of Borg, it transpired that he, he actually uh, didn't, didn't think of the universality of quantum mechanics, which right. is a, a, an apparatus that must be classic in yeah. order to do quantum mechanics. Yeah. But then there are people like uh, Marcus Arndt that are, are, are pushing the boundaries further and further, so they are superposing bigger and bigger, massive, more and more massive objects. So people are starting right. believing, well, maybe there is, we don't find this limit, so maybe there is not one. But right. I think that though, it is not striking the, yeah. they, they can, they, we can appeal, uphold both of the, of the viewpoints. Yeah. I don't think there is any striking evidence in one or the other direction. You, right. you are still, I mean, it's still a, a supposition that, that, right. you, that quantum mechanics is holding everywhere because of complex interactions that you right. show up. Well, I think it's just that quantum mechanics itself doesn't give you that limit. That that would have to come from the outside. Whereas, like, I mean, this is what you were saying, essentially. Like, with relativity, like, you could calculate the limit of where that would stop. Quantum mechanics, it, if you trust quantum mechanics itself, it says, I apply to everything. So you would just have to step outside of that and say, I don't believe everything quantum mechanics says, kind of thing, right? So we have one last question. Or no more questions. <laughs> now it's your time to speak up. I just have a comment to the, to the language thing. Like, <laughs> isn't the language of the physics actually mathematics? Like, everything... I do not certainly believe that. No. 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 Mathematics is a kind of tool to make sense and explain it just to, we can say it and serve it so in a form that somebody that can understand that kind of sort of certain language and someone makes sense of it. But it's not really the way that I do describe things in the world. So if if it's today it's and sometimes hot for you, yeah? No, it's really warm. Explain it to me in the sense of mathematics, please. Yeah, explain to me in the sense of Mm -hmm. So that's that's exactly the point because I do not have yeah. the language for that. I cannot explain it. Yeah. I can't give you just a projection of what I do think that would be the case, and then somebody just beside me have another projection, another projection, another projection, thousands of billions of interpretations, and get so on, so on, so on, and it's a never-ending story because we fail to do it. As Wittgenstein says, that it's a game of language. I, I, I do need that. So we have two last short comments, please. <laughs> First, if you think mathematics is exactly the same issue, so mathematics just seems to be so exact, but it has inherently exactly the same, the same issues that, that you grow up with it, you, you start, I mean, you grow and trusting all the things you you link to axioms which don't have which don't have uh, any correlation with physical uh, issues. I mean axioms are just getting started issues. Uh, so so there, there is an inherent problematic uh, with, with using mathematics in order to, to, to describe uh, everything here. So we just have to go. Sorry, it's the last one. <laughs> um, I think when you uh, think about a new language, then you have to think about first language you learned, did you didn't know any language at all? And then at this point, like everything is coupled with a lot of experience and especially with emotions. When you learn the world matter, but it's not objective, it's highly emotional. And I think everything is in that sense extremely complicated. And so I think there is no point of having an objective language so because every person has his own experience on the things or that makes that much more problematic because then we have, for each person, a reality. <laughs> um, do you want to comment on that or is that the
a good final. I mean, the only thing I would say is I, th I think these like embodied approaches to language are really interesting on this question. Like if you look at like someone like Mark Johnson or someone, um, their views of language and how it develops through physical interaction and stuff, it, it makes these links sort of tighter in a way. Okay, thank you very much. We can continue the discussion if you want to. The formal part is over. <laughs>